Theatre of the Absurd, one of the more bizarre and out there theatrical movements, one where the absurdity of human existence is pushed to the forefront and thought and action have no discernible conclusion. But what exactly is this style and why is it important in making sense of our own lives? Hello, welcome to Organic Acting. So what is Theatre of the Absurd? We're going to have to travel back to the first half of the 20th century to find our answer. After the devastation of two world wars, many practitioners in Europe felt disillusioned. For them, it was difficult to believe an aware, omnipotent, sympathetic God could exist after humanity had experienced such death and brutality on a global scale. As far as they were concerned, the church's teachings regarding a powerful yet benign figure way up in the clouds watching over man, his creation, just didn't hold up. The absurdists believed man was alone on earth, abandoned, lost in a void of pointless, futile actions. Think about it. We get up, get ready for school, so we can study, so we can receive qualifications, so we can get jobs, go to work, earn money, to fill our lives with things we don't need. All until the day we're too old to work anymore and then we die. Pretty heavy stuff. Using the Greek myth of Sisyphus as a metaphor, 20th century philosopher Albert Camus demonstrated the absurdity of existence. In the myth, Sisyphus was punished by Zeus and forced to roll a gigantic boulder up a mountain, only for it to roll back down once it neared the top. Sisyphus would march back down the mountain and repeat the action again and again and again for all eternity. <laughs> Damn. So where does this bring us into the theatrical world of the absurd? Absurdist theatrical practitioners such as Beckett, Adamov, Ionesco, Genet, and later Pinter represented, theatrically, an existence devoid of meaning. If life didn't make sense, why should theatre? Theatre of the absurd rejects realism, naturalism, and logic, preferring to use language that attempts to communicate the impossible. Characters perform pointless, long-winded actions. They make no progress, literally or figuratively. Take Samuel Beckett's Waiting for Godot, a play about two tramps, Vladimir and Estragon, on a country road, by a tree, waiting for the character Godot to arrive. By the play's end, Godot hasn't turned up, and Vladimir and Estragon are left alone, waiting, choosing not to leave, right back where they started. Characters performing pointless, long-winded actions? Check. Characters making no progress, literally or figuratively? Check. In Beckett's one-act play Endgame, four characters shelter in a bare room away from the outside world following an unseen catastrophe. Ham is paralysed, his servant Clove is unable to sit down, while Ham's legless parents Nag and Nell live in two dustbins situated by a back wall. The characters are confined to the room with nowhere to go, the outside world seemingly destroyed and dead. Unlike traditional theatre, it is impossible and in itself pointless to try and apply analysis, critique or to give absurdist pieces a meaning. Take this often quoted moment from the play itself. We're not beginning to... to... mean something. Mean something? You and I mean something? <laughs> That's a good one. <sighs> well, that was thoroughly weird, even depressing. However, the exciting thing about the theatre of the absurd is that although plays can be bleak, dreamlike and even nightmarish, tragedy, or in this case the tragic nature of a humanity without purpose, is often mixed with comedy. Absurdist theatre can be funny. Say, I am happy! I am happy! <laughs> so am I! So am I! We are happy! We are happy! What do we do now, now that we're happy? <laughs> Born in Dublin in 1906, Beckett is perhaps the most well-known of the absurdist playwrights, creating many weird and wonderful pieces for the stage. In his works, language, 
words and dialogue can seem confusing and disjointed, but ultimately they work alongside Beckett's love for Commedia dell'arte and music hall and can create some bizarre and genuinely hilarious moments. The absurdists were not interested in creating dramatic circumstances through theatre or offering a solution. This isn't Augusto Boal's Theatre of the Oppressed. But rather, they preferred to present moments of bewilderment and ridiculousness, as well as mystery and anxiety, to accurately represent this view of the human condition. We're going to move on from Samuel Beckett to one of my favourite playwrights of this genre, Harold Pinter. Pinter, the son of a Jewish tailor in Hackney, East London, was heavily influenced by Beckett and the tradition of the theatre of the absurd. The worlds Pinter creates are equally as barren, his characters as lost and without meaning. However, and this is, for me, where Pinter excels in the theatre of the absurd, he was extremely fond of a sense of menace. The idea that the threat of violence is always present, an impulse to which all human beings are susceptible. It lurks behind every smile, every piece of small talk, every handshake, every companionable hug. Have a sip. Go on. Have a sip from my glass. Sit on my lap. Take a long, cool sip. Put your head back and open your mouth. Take that glass away from me. Lie on the floor. Go on. I'll pour it down your throat. Characters can say one thing and mean something entirely different. They can demonstrate a simple intention and then tear off in an opposite direction. Threat, danger, violence, all hide within and without the subject, waiting to pounce upon the unexpected. Of course, the entire notion of the theatre of the absurd, of man alone, blind, stumbling through the darkness, supports Pinter's wish to present all unseen menaces, even those that exist beyond the room's four walls waiting to get in. New neighbours pay a visit, old acquaintances knock at the front door, a phone call from the past shatters the status quo. In Pinter's The Dumb Waiter, two hired hitmen wait in a basement for their next target. They talk about tea, stories in the newspaper, and the room around them. Their situation is rarely discussed. While they're waiting, the dumb waiter in the room springs to life and sends down a food order. The men scramble to put some bits together, even though they only have their packed lunch to hand. A message from the outside world arrives, pitting one hitman against the other. In the room, Rose shelters from the outside world in her broken down bedsit with her husband, Bert. The landlord, a visiting couple, and a stranger from the basement all visit Bert and Rose, shattering the quote unquote normality of their lives and the safety of the four walls. Like Beckett, Pinter's words and language can be used to dizzying effect, the rhythm of the language being more significant than the words themselves. You used to love flowers, didn't you? Do you still love flowers? He adores flowers. The other day I saw him emptying a piss pot into a bowl of lilies. My dad was a gardener. Not your granddad. No, my dad. That's right, he was. He was always walking about with a lawnmower. What, even in the old Kent Road? He was a man of the soil. How about your granddad? I never had one. Yet small talk, the unnecessary banter we all use with each other doesn't just represent the futility of our everyday lives and add comedy to the piece. It draws the audience in and invites them to make conclusions for themselves. The characters do not tell the audience everything, but leave them to discover the incomplete parts. They come up with hidden meanings from interpreting instances of silence and repetition. Pinter didn't wish to lay everything out on a silver platter for an audience to devour without thought. He was even less interested in instructing his audience to make change, although, admittedly, many of his later works were very political in their message. Pinter was once asked what his plays were about. He responded, The Weasel Under the Cocktail Cabinet. Although the response was an offhand comment and Pinter himself regretted such a label forever dominating his work, I think it's rather fitting. So, 
What can we take from the theatre of the absurd? This is a theatrical movement less concerned with the slice of life of realism or naturalism, less concerned with the politics of epic theatre, but rather a recognition of the futility of life and all the bizarre, pointless, hopeless, hilarious actions that come with it. But can absurdism teach us anything at all? Camus proposed that Sisyphus recognised the absurdity of his own plight every time he travelled back down the mountain to find his fallen boulder, ready to roll it back up and start the process again. In that moment, he could be satisfied with his plight. No longer striving for something better or looking for answers from God, he was, in that moment, truly happy. Surely if we recognise the absurd in our own lives, we are able to live content in a world without meaning. Want to learn about other styles of theatre? Have a look-see at these two videos here. Oh, and don't be so absurd as to not click those like and subscribe buttons.